Thank you very much, Doctor. You appreciate it. Um, okay, so we're going to with that we've uh, we wrapped up the introduction of all the panelists, and I want to turn everyone's attention to the shared doc, the link of which is in the chat. Um, and we have a number of questions already. So um, I'm actually I posted one as a as a as a, a starter, but I'm going to pick up with with some of the others. So uh, we'll get back to the value of death in a second. So the the first question here um, is from David E. The, the term translation sometimes makes it sound as if one does the research first and then thinks about translating it to an application or production. Is there a relationship about thinking about translation from the start or a way to link partners from the end of the development pipeline to those that work near the front of it? Um, if that's valuable, are there examples, materials, or other domains where we could we could use to drive change? Go ahead. Can I go ahead? Yes, great. please. Thank you. I think this is a great question. And I can say that when I first started in my research at the University of Toronto, um, we would start developing a technology and become quite enamored with that technology with our heads in the sand and publishing and, you know, all of this. And um, I hadn't thought in my case, because it's drug development and drug formulations, hadn't thought about whether or not there'd be uptake by clinicians, um, hadn't thought about whether or not patients, this would actually be beneficial to patients. And so I think if you really want to translate in a meaningful way, you need to go out to those stakeholders from the beginning. You know, I've got an interesting idea. What do you think about this? And or even better, what are some unmet medical needs that I could help you with? Um, so I think that's a, it's an excellent, excellent question that I've learned, uh, the hard way. And so, and so really, uh, you know, try to put patients and clinicians first when it comes to translation and design of the technologies we're working on. Great. Yeah, I would, Thank you. Go ahead, oh, Dan. I was just going to say, I would echo that a hundred percent. Um, I think in general, yeah, if we can really start to change the mindset of, you know, what is the need, what is the application that's driving the questions? I think that will really help to ensure success. Um, because again, there's a, a lot of really good ideas that if you're just looking, like you said, uh, kind of head in the sand, you may not realize, you know, is that actually feasible or viable when it comes to commercialization? So, so definitely 100% agree that that needs to be the driver in a lot of, in a lot of applications. Great, thank you. Uh, actually, a quick follow up to that. And so, um, is there, when you're doing these, when you're making these connections um, with partners that are maybe near the end of the pipeline um, early on, um, do you have any advice for how to, um, how to make sure that you protect IP, especially in the beginning, um, where you're not necessarily sure if it's going to blossom into a product, but while still gaining useful information that you can use to move forward? That is a hard question. I guess maybe I'll take a stab at it. Um, I think, to be honest, really, the only way that I can think is uh, NDAs, I guess, are your friend. Um, I think really, you know, once you start talking with the company, I mean, you have to be open because otherwise, if you're kind of talking in circles, it, it turns out that the connection doesn't really happen. So I think really having an NDA or at least some level of trust. And again, I know that and a lot of times in an NDA, you can kind of specify upfront, you know, what is the protected IP, who owns it? And I think you just need to be kind of upfront in those discussions to say, you know, this is our IP. This is where the connections that we can make, you know, what are we kind of keeping, you know, behind closed doors? But again, you just need to be open about it. So it's definitely a hard question. There isn't a, you know, global rule. I think it's just going to be case by case dependent, but that's my take on it. Uh, from my personal experience, I think a good way is to keep recording everything you discuss with your partners, your collaborators. Uh, especially right now, we have uh, uh, really good tools to uh, record all the meetings, right? Uh, the autopilot, copilot, uh, ChatGPT can help you to make that recording. So it's easier today. Um, I'll move to question three here. Infrastructure and training seems to be broadly recognized, a broadly recognized barrier to broad uptake of machine learning tools for materials design. Is there any agency or organization taking the lead in funding work on overcoming these barriers? 
Uh, actually, at the video, we have a research program, we have uh, university programs. Uh, you can apply that uh, pro programs we uh, support with the computing powers. And I'd say for any trainees that are in Toronto or in Canada, we've got tremendous programs through the Vector Institute and the Acceleration Consortium, and that will only increase with time. And I expect some will be become available uh, virtually as well for folks outside of Canada. Yeah, I think I would add to, to what you said. I think automation is probably going to be a big factor. I think in order to kind of really scale these up, we need to be able to translate data, understand it, and even... I guess, curate data. So for instance, knowing what data is important because we're getting a lot of, you know, if you think about in-situ monitoring for some of these manufacturing technologies, we're getting a lot of information, but is it useful? So I think data curation is also a big factor. So again, I think it, it comes to a lot of data management and then also bridging the length scales. So again, the, you know, a lot of times we may be looking at smaller scales or just the, you know, FEA scale. We kind of need to know kind of what are the data translations from, you know, atomistic to the macro scale and know what's important. So it, it is a big challenge and there and there's a lot of work that can be done. And I think it's just a matter of tackling those instances. Go ahead, Dr. Allen. Yeah, I was going to say that I think comes back to that great question that was asked first around, um, you know, around translation in general. And I think part of it is when we're doing that basic research, and I agree that not all basic research has to result in product development. Um, and, and actually, some of the basic research that does end up resulting in product development may do so 30, 40, whatever decades from now. Um, and we don't even realize it right now. But we have to also be thinking about like, cost of the product, market, competitive landscape, um, you know, whether or not scaling and scale up and manufacturing are feasible. And I think sometimes when we're doing our research and designing these technologies, we don't think about all of these other factors that are so important. Great. Um, I'm going to follow up uh, to, uh, for a to direct question to you, Dr. Allen. In addition to the fear of applying AI ML to Formula, formulation of drug of discovery in the pharma companies, do you also face not invented in-house situations? If so, how do you convince big pharma companies to work with you instead of work of them working internally with their databases? It's a great question. And I have to say it's early days for our startup. We've only been around for five, six months. Um, and I can tell you the approach that we've taken is you know, we validated our technology and our, our approach with case studies. So actually designing new formulations of drugs and then comparing them to uh, marketed drug formulations and showing that, you know, how much better they are. So we've actually had to provide that data to, you know, to give them some, some um, degree of confidence in the technology. So that's the first piece. The next piece is that it's got to be collaborative. Um, it has to be kind of like, this is the behind the CDA and the agreement. There's got to be a lot of, um, you know, openness and transparency so they can see what it is that we're doing. And it's not a black box, um, and that they can see that they can contribute to this and they can provide input on what it is that we're doing. Uh, so it's not, you know, here's our agreement and we go away and do our own thing and come back in six months. It's like, we're working with you and you're part of this. So we'll go on to Calvin L's question here. This is for Dr. Hicks and other panelists. In your opinion, what is the most important unmet needs that software and AI can make can make the biggest difference in materials informatics? Good question. Um, that's a big question. Um, I guess I can give an example of where I think, at least in the context of the work that I do, you know, where I see a big need. And I think a lot of it has to do with um, verification and validation. So it, it kind of is that, you know, translation up. But having an understanding of, I make this material, do I have confidence that it's going to work in the application? So for instance, one example is additive manufacturing. It's a relatively, uh, maybe not relatively new, but it's, it's definitely a hot topic. And basically you're building the material and the part at the same time. And so there's a lot of uncertainties that come with that. And then we're essentially trying to get a good understanding of that. And so we're looking at things like in situ monitoring to say, okay, was the process good? And do we expect the material properties that we made kind of on the fly? Are they application relevant? And so with that, I guess, coming back to your question, there's a lot of data that's being generated. There's a lot of simulation work that can be used to kind of validate that process, because essentially, if you were to make this in the lab, you have to make and break and test, and that's expensive. So if we can supplant these efforts with modeling and simulation, 
with AI algorithms to basically have confidence in this, then we can start to move the needle a little bit and actually accelerate the manufacturing of these um, technologies. So that's just one example where I see uh, this being a big, um, I guess, area of, of need. Okay, great. Uh, I'm gonna go on to Phil Kay's question. Um, it's got a few pieces here. If a funding agency supported data collection generation, code development for model development, and software development, what level of government's data rights is appropriate for industry folks to feel comfortable? Um, an example, exclusive data rights for the training data set, at least some rights, copyrights to be held, open, opening the code, but not the final software package, code and the final software made publicly available? How do we strike the balance between promoting public benefit and the desire to monetize these efforts? I guess I'll take a stab. This one's a tough one. Um, I think it, again, I think it almost depends on kind of the funding agency up front being, you know, defining the requirements. Again, if it is kind of classified work, for instance, you know, it can't necessarily be on GitHub. Um, alternatively, you know, depending on the contract, you might be able to open up certain functionality or certain data sets. If anything, I feel like a lot of the instances I've seen is the code might be available, but the actual raw data sets may need to be behind closed doors, or maybe that's a little bit more proprietary. So again, it, that one's a hard one to ask because I think it's really dependent on the application, who the funding agency is. So I don't think there's one answer that kind of fits all the boxes, but that's at least my take on it. I don't know if any of the other panelists have any comments or thoughts. Okay, thank you. All right, uh, I'm gonna we're gonna ask pose a Zach T's question here. As AI, ML, autonomous labs become more powerful, can we incorporate recycling processes pathways into the core philosoph philosophical definition of materials discovery? I worry we are accelerating the discovery of forever chemicals, materials, waste, etc. I can just say, I think this is something that that we've thought a lot about at the Acceleration Consortium. Um, and, you know, in my own experience, in my own lab, with um, the extent to which we've, uh, you know, started to use automation and really miniaturizing some of our processes, he's actually reduced, we've reduced the quantities of solvents, as an example, that we're using, reduced the quantities of API or drug that we're using. Um, so from a sustainability perspective, it's been great. Um, I do agree, though, this kind of concept, we've talked about this um, at some of our meetings, this kind of concept of you're just generating a lot of molecules or materials very quickly, and what if they are? So we, I think we need to constrain um, some of the, or, or, or factor that into some of the development that we're doing. And it's it's a really important point to think about. And um, it's something that we've started to focus on and we've, we've developed these core values actually around this uh, and need to implement those into our, uh, into our consortium. So I think it's an important point to raise. Fantastic. Thank you. Uh, we're going to go to Scott M's question. What role have ontologies played in easing the translation problem, is there any integrated work being done among government, industry, and academia similar to the EU onto trans project? How might LLMs and AI affect this landscape? I guess I can take a stab at that one. Um, so I guess with respect to ontologies, I know there's been a lot of work in, I guess, defining ontologies for different manufacturing processes and also coming up with um, common data models, common data dictionaries to basically categorize and kind of put these essentially into boxes or classes so that we have an understanding of what is being collected, it's standardized, and it's, it, and it's translatable. So there's also a, kind of a data exchange format. So there is a lot of work. I know there's a lot of ontological works in different, uh, probably in the biology space more, so you could probably talk to that, Dr. Allen, uh, but also in the manufacturing space. I know that they're trying to define these ontologies and come up with the schema so that way data is translatable, data is kind of standardized across uh, the domain. Uh, I think uh, 
in interpolation is one of the powerful application of uh, AI, right? So uh, we can we can start from a, a small and uh, using the AI power to interpolate everything to make, to increase the scale, increase the uh, the scope even. Great, thank you. Um, and uh, for anyone who's joining, I just want to advertise that we have a shared doc. It's been shared. It, the, the link has been put in the chat. If you're interested in, in posing questions uh, for the panelists, please go ahead and and put them in the document, and we'll 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 go through them in order. I'm going to answer David E's question. Um, Dr. Allen's response suggests that translating data is a growing part of translating a material. Does interest does industry think in terms of taking certification or validation data directly as a way to accelerate product delivery? Is there much organized discussion about this in industry? David Hicks spoke to this by listing validation and verification and additive manufacturing. As it happens, this is a central topic in a new NASA STRI uh, called IMQ CAM, working on uh, metal additive manufacturing digital, digital twin or any comments thereof. Oh, I think you might be on mute, Dr. Allen. Did you say anything? I was going to say maybe you have a comment on that. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I guess I'm glad that you brought up the NASA STRI. I don't. I'm, maybe I'm not familiar with, with that exact work, but actually, um, some of the work that um, Lyft has been kind of looking at is actually a NASA document that tried to put together what would be what would a VNV look like for materials qualification in the context of modeling and simulation. And so that's something that we've been looking at at Lyft is how can we kind of participate in that effort. So. I do think that that is a big drive in industry, at least in some of the the working groups that Lyft has been a part of is, again, going back to that um, common data model, there's an additive manufacturing common data model that's really trying to also engage in that effort. So that way we know what data to collect, what are the important data elements, and how can that be used to certify uh, these manufacturing processes. So I do think that there is a big drive, and I do think there are quite a few different organizations who are tackling this. And I think I want to say that the Air Force is also looking at one. I forget the name of it. Um, so, but there are, there is a lot of drive and effort into that. And so it's kind of a multi-pronged approach where this group is working on it, this group is working on it. So it's definitely a, a hot topic for sure. Great. Okay, I'm going to go to Jane G's question which is a follow-up to Scott's question. Would, would anyone be able to suggest some good steps for material science communities to better connect or embrace ontology work that's been done? Or there is a or is there a disconnect um, or not invented attitude that keeps communities from adopting already developed ontology schemas, et cetera? So I think the, the heart of the question is really in standardization. What is, what's the opinion of standardization of some of these ontologies? Again, I guess I can take a stab at that one. Uh, it relates to kind of the, the previous discussion, but I do think there's a lot of communities out there that, that I think you can be involved with. I think NIST is, for instance, leading some of those efforts to define those ontologies. And I do think that they're trying to kind of keep it collate, obviously open, they're open to working with groups. Um, but I think they're also trying to make sure that there aren't multiple standards. And so I think they are trying to get a lot of people involved. So that way there's consensus to say, okay, these are the important data elements. This is how they should be defined. So I do think there's a lot of work there. And I mean, there are probably some, you know, siloed endeavors, but again, I think really to kind of push the needle here, we do need to kind of get involved with those groups that are already actively working on it. Uh, so we can kind of make a change there. It's interesting. We've heard today a couple of times this kind of concept of not invented here. And it's unfortunate that th that, that is reality, right? We're, we, we're faced with that and there's a lot of siloing. And yet in my field anyways, during COVID, we just saw this tremendous um, interest in collaboration, like not just in a specific area of research, but many areas of research and across countries. Um, and I, I think, you know, this comes down to as scientists, we have to commit to advancement of the field. And in my case, in the area that I work in, we have to center patients. And if we do that, then that means that whole kind of not invented here go, should go, should go um, to the wayside, at least for government and academic uh, organizations. Fantastic. 
Um, we'll go to Calvin L's question. Uh, while new solutions are really exciting, how much effort do you think we should make in investing in existing solutions? Cur currently, some solutions like SRIM uh, feel outdated, crash often, requires a Windows environment, but is a popular tool for simulating ion beams in material into materials. I think it's uh, really hard to predict which uh, technology will be uh, the final uh, successful one, right? So, like uh, in the in in the AI uh, area, initially we are uh, enthusiastic about the the CNN convolutional neural network. Then uh, we found the transformer, uh, and we also have RNN. Right now, the transformer is uh, is a is a star in the language model, but uh, we we still seeing a difficulty to process uh, videos, uh, images, uh, data, right? So uh, it's really hard to make a decision at the early stage. Great, yeah. Um, I have a uh, so. I have a question that's it tags on to some of the questions we've we've already addressed. So th there's it's a two part. So what are the challenges uniquely addressed in industry, and then what roles do you see academia and national labs in uh, um, playing in terms of addressing these challenges? I guess maybe I'll take a one stab at it. Um, so I guess at least from the context of what can academia and national labs do, I do think that there's a lot of, I guess, there's a big knowledge base there, right? So for instance, in the industry kind of knows the application, but I think a lot of the technical experts getting into the, the detail comes from academia and um, national labs. And so I think essentially academia and national labs could essentially serve as the intellectual powerhouse, if you will. And I think they can really help to, you know, when they know the industry knows the challenge, but they not, may not know how to solve it. So I really think they might be able to help drive the innovation because they have the know-how, they know the skills. And I mean, ML and AI is, you know, everybody's talking about it and it's a big thing, but a lot of people don't necessarily know how to use it effectively. And especially, you know, in the leadership communities of the industry, they just know ML and AI, they've seen it, but they don't know how to use it. And so I think kind of grounding it, but then also having the expertise from these labs and academia, I think they might be able to play a big role here. Well, I think the academia national lab is more like a pool of technologies. So uh, we in industry we we do not know which one will be tomorrow's superstar, right? When when the the new superstars comes comes shows up, uh, we probably do do not have the enough intelligent uh, technicians to achieve that. But uh, uh, at this time, the national labs, the academia can provide uh, uh, human intelligence uh, for for that. I think some case in in some cases also academia can can de-risk some of this, right? Like prove it out, demonstrate that it works and should be adopted by industry maybe at at larger scale. Great. Um, I have a question. Um, it, I'm sure that there's there's uh, there are many people who may have an an idea or maybe even have a proof of concept of that idea. Um, if do you have any advice? for how to best approach an industry partner um, on an idea, on a pitch? What, what you know, I'm sure you've seen it many times, but what's really stood out in your experience that's made the pitch uh, more, more successful, made your, made your ear uh, come closer to the idea? What, what do you think is, is good advice for that, for that? I can maybe start. Um, one of the things that I would say when I'm pitching something to to a company is I do some research on the company and the pitch is really tailored to that company or that audience. So I look to see, you know, what is the company doing? I try to think about what their problems might be, how I could help to solve those problems. Um, so if it's a technology that I've developed or a formulation or whatever it might be, I can see how that fits into their narrative or their story. So I don't have one pitch that I use for all companies, all audiences. It's it's really a tailored approach. 
And I, yeah. I, try, to, I try to go in with a soft sell, I would say. Yeah, I think each company, they have different uh, preference. Uh, it's really hard to have a uniform method to approach all the companies. And uh, for NVIDIA, uh, our CEO is very powerful and has insight about the development of technology. Uh, just uh, look out what he speaks. We have a new question here uh, from again. The spirit of ML AI, the ML AI approach to discover new materials is a hands-off approach, where whereas each specific piece of material uh, a discovery requires arbitrary depth of understanding. How do you balance the two there? That's a good question. Um, Cause yeah, I know that there's a lot of AI ML approach for, yeah, like like it mentions in the question, materials discovery. Uh, but once you've found the material, knowing kind of what are the different facets of that material. So again, I think it goes to a little bit more into, I guess maybe the next step in the process. So you found the material, how do you synthesize the material? How, you, how do you manufacture the material? And that's gonna change the properties depending on how it's made. So I think it's taking a, a more in depth almost a different faceted approach to, okay, now I have the material, what do I need to do with it? So for instance, again, that goes back to manufacturing. Right. For instance, you can go ahead and check to see, um, you know, if you actually make it, you can actually do these in situ monitorings and, you know, check to see what are the data outputs and you can use ML and AI there to confirm or use data to kind of basically say, what are the properties based on this ensemble approach of, you know, printing a whole bunch of things or manufacturing in different ways. So um, I think it's just a different way of looking at it, but, but yes, definitely an important aspect for sure. Okay, great. Um, I'm curious, um, what, what do you think was the biggest, um, the biggest step of of uh, the transition between going from academia to industry, what what was the big change there in your thought process about this problem of materials discovery? How you think about AI, about algorithms? What was the biggest change in your thought process that you saw when you when you uh, transitioned to industry? I guess I'll start. I, I think really it was the shift in mindset of, I guess, fundamental research to applied. I think, it, it, I mean, it probably is, it seems, you know, trivial, but I think the gravity of it is it, just a completely different mindset. And I think that that was just, again, I think it's a good mindset, like both have merit, but I think that seems to be the biggest transition for me is, you know, I'd, I'd love to continue, you know, keep doing fundamental research of, ah, okay, you know, how can I look at this? But the company's not going to necessarily pay me or, you know, say, hey, you can't look at this. So I think that's been the biggest challenge for me. Um, but again, it's it's an interesting challenge because it, it does focus more on manufacturability, synthesizability, which again is a problem that I think still needs tackling. Uh, for my personal experience, I think uh, when I uh, doing my PhD, Oh, uh, we have limited resource, so we focus on what we can do, what we can deliver. Uh, but in industry, I think uh, the mindset changed to what we can uh, collaborate in. So you have a bunch of people sitting over there, and how do how do we together to achieve a, a huge something huge? Right? Yes. Great. Um, let's see. Okay, so we have a new question from Matt E. Um, following from Dr. Akel's point about humbleness, how best should companies interact with the academic publishing environment? With the exposure they would get either way, do they really need to publish closed papers in Nature and Science with press releases and non-peer-reviewed marketing, or is that the company's desired deliverable? In my opinion, there is a danger that the current approach is too discouraging and demoralizing for academic researchers if it seems that scale can solve all problems in the field, maybe it can. My my personal take, I, I think might be similar. I, I'm delighted to see papers coming out of industry. Uh, any data, uh, results, whatever that they'll share, whether they're positive or negative, I'm always delighted to see. And, and I didn't really quite speak to that on my slide around challenges, but one of the challenges that we have in the drug space or drug development space is that there is a lot of data in industry that we'll never see. 
right? Um, and so the more that we can see that data and the results, uh, the better off I think we all are. Um, and I and I don't necessarily think they're always better papers, uh, but they're important papers as well. Great. Um, I think I'm going to wrap up with one last question, um, and it's about it's it's focused on 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 those that are interested in maybe making a transition to industry. Um, what data skills uh, are needed to be successful, and are there any recommendations to gain these skills? Yeah, I agree a hundred percent. It's the it's the soft skills, communication skills, interpersonal skills, you know, ability to collaborate and work in a team. Um, we have super bright people in academia, super bright people in industry, um, and I think what really helps people get ahead um, is it, are these soft skills or get noticed or or succeed even in just in an interview are these soft skills. Yeah, I guess uh, echo both. Um, yeah, definitely communication, and I think, but also being being able to communicate, I guess, broadly, but then also scientifically and technically, because you're going to be working with both in industry. You're going to be working with kind of the boots to the ground people, but then you're also going to need to communicate it to leadership. So it's multifaceted in that sense, but yeah, definitely communication. Uh, I want to go through a little uh, more detail uh, bit about the communication skill. It's not only talk to people's uh, more useful things is your be clear about what you need to do and be clear about what they going to do. So make that record, write it down is always much helpful. Great. Uh, and with that, we're right about at time. Um, so I'm going to ask that we see if we can get the link for the next uh, session, which is the uh, repository session. We should see that come up in the chat. Uh, I just want to wrap up um, by thanking the, the panelists, Dr. Allen, Dr. Hicks, Dr. Yu, and Dr. Akol. Um, if you have any comments to add, uh, I, I leave the, the floor open for a minute or two. Please feel free to, to add to chime in. Any final comments? I was just going to say to all the young people that are here today, and there seem to be some trainees based on the questions that were asked, I just think this is a super exciting time. Um, I wish I wish I was young. I'm not that young anymore, um, but super exciting time for all of you. Uh, agree. Yeah. Uh, go ahead. Oh, no, I was just going to say, yeah, agree. And I think regardless of what path you choose, I don't think there's a wrong path. I think academia, national lab, industry, I think there's a lot of work that can be done with respect to data algorithms. So I think you're in a good spot. You're in, a right, in the right field and it, it the world is your oyster essentially. So, so yeah, you guys are going to do great and good luck. And yeah, I envy you. <laughs> I, I want to say um, maybe uh, academia industry has different goal, uh, different driven. However, the, uh, the skills, the uh, knowledges you learn are going to be uh, uh, help you both either in industry or academic. Fantastic. Uh, with that, I'm going to just wrap up and say the Google Docs going to remain live for two more weeks. If people want to continue to add thoughts or ideas, um, the session, the next session is began began a minute ago, uh, but the link is there for the for for that session. And uh, with that, we thank the panelists and everyone for their time. Thank you very much. This is a very very nice discussion. Thanks, everyone. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye. Bye.